Okay, y'all open up. You can't cheat this time because the full scripture is not on the cover of your book. Open up your Bibles to uh, Acts 26, 24. If you don't have your Bibles with you, Pew Bibles in front of you. This is on page 911. I don't know what that means, but it must mean something. Okay? Now, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, big, huge set of questions. Um, what does the word Christian mean? These days, for some people, uh, the phrase of the word Christian has maybe some negative connotations, particularly late night comedians seem to have a negative connotation with it. Um, now, for most of the country, at least two thirds of the country or more, it is a very positive word. But what does the word mean? Now, some people may think, okay, Christian means a nice person. You look at somebody, oh, she's a good Christian person or something like that. Well, the problem with that is, is the Christian is not a nice person. Or, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Just because somebody's nice doesn't make them a Christian. I mean, there's nice atheists. I know nice atheists. Um, I know a nice Buddhist cage-fighting attorney, friend of mine I went to high school with in Birmingham. He's real nice, but he's not a Christian. Just because you're nice doesn't mean you're a Christian. And some other people will say, well, look, I'm a Christian because this is basically still a Christian country. That doesn't mean anything, okay? Just because the country that you're in is Christian doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Um, if you're in a Starbucks, are you a latte? Okay, some of you, if you're wearing that crimson and white jersey, did Nick Saban actually recruit you on the team? No. Just because you're wearing a jersey does not mean you're on the team. So, what is a Christian? A Christian is somebody who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. And somebody who follows Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at what this word means this week and next week. We're going to look at this scripture today. So here we go. Verse 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. Now, by the way, Festus was at the time the Roman Imperial Governor of Judea. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. Verse 25. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. Remember, the king is another guy. The king is Agrippa. Verse 26. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it's not done in the corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Verse 28. And Agrippa said to Paul, you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Verse 29, Paul replied, short time or long, and I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. This is the word of God for the people of God and all God's people said. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Agrippa's key line there, I really like it in the, the old King James version of the Bible. It's got this, I don't, I don't know, I'm not going to start being one of these King James only guys, but there's just sometimes the King James knows how to phrase something. Okay? And it, here it is. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And it's like Shakespeare or something. Like that. There are people, folks, who go all their lives. And that's as far as they go. They only go as far as a river. Ever since Jesus came, there have been a lot of people in every age and in every nation that were almost persuaded to be Christians. But only going that far gets you nowhere with God. There are too many people who are happy being an almost Christian. So, first question was, what is a Christian name? My next question is, what is an almost Christian? First, an almost Christian, for lack of a better phrase, has a lot of virtue. Okay? But what do you mean, virtue? I mean, all the virtues of modern secular society, all the ones they approve of. And we hear the virtues defended in the rhetorical question, can't an atheist be a good person? Can't a so-and-so be a good person? And we also hear it in this very defensive statement that we hear sometimes, I'm a good person! Right? What people mean when they say those things is they mean that at some level they were taught the rules. Don't lie, don't steal, don't oppress the poor, don't cheat. And even people today who are not Christians recognize that they have some reason to follow these ideas. Ish. In our culture generally, 
Uh, we look down on people who lie or slander unless it furthers some kind of political agenda. Yeah. And if you don't want to know what I'm talking about, you haven't really been watching the news for the last 40 years. Uh, not 40 days, 40 years. Uh, almost Christians are more than willing to love and help others. They want everyone to have, you know, be involved in some kind of mutual assistance in some sort of unselfish way. And they set the example. You know, they feed the hungry, they clothe the naked, they give the things that they can spare out to those who are in need. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The almost Christian has a lot of virtue. The second thing is they have sort of an outward form of religion. Uh, not unlike what is described in the Bible. Outwardly, they are Christian. And what do I mean by that? Uh, they do nothing that God forbids. I mean, most of them don't even cuss. Unless they, you know, nobody can hear. Uh, there's no immorality involved in their lives. Unless, you know, somebody can quickly erase their browser history. There's not even idle words, you know, unless that person's in a bad mood. Then there's no backstabbing. Unless they can spin the story to their advantage. The person doesn't drink much either. The person is never a glutton, and the person never, ever lies. Unless there's some advantage to it. And this person would never take revenge if somebody does her wrong. He's a good person, so to speak. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And boy, do they do good. And not just the easy kind, they do the hard kind. Whatever your hands find to do, do with all your might. And it all sounds really good that he or she can have the form of faith and religion but not the power. He and she are concerned with the outside and how things look. So they have virtue and they're outwardly religious. The third thing is the almost Christian is sincere. Now by sincerity, I mean this. Deep down, at some level, they really mean it. Because if they don't, then they're no better than a pagan, at least in their own mind. So they do good things, but it's to escape some kind of negative consequence or something, like, like, like hell. Uh, they es the escape from hell is its own reward, so to speak. And hell can have a whole lot of meanings. It doesn't have to actually be the literal hell. They can do good to avoid losing their friends. They can do good to get something out of it. They can do good to avoid punishment. They can do good things to gain reputation. They use all the means of grace available from the Christian church, but they not necessarily a Christian. And if you live like that, you can be sincere until your head explodes. But it doesn't make you a Christian. If just sincerity is in your heart, you're not only an almost Christian, at some level, you're also a hypocrite. So sincerity is required to be an almost Christian. Sincerity has a real plan to serve God, a hearty desire to do God's will. An almost Christian really wants to please God in everything, in word, in deed, in all he or she does or leaves undone. And this plan runs like a river through the almost Christian's life, a thread through a tapestry, a theme in a symphony. And he does good, he abstains from evil, and he connects with God any way he can. He's an almost Christian. And you're saying, wait a minute, Trav, you're weird. How can someone have virtue and godliness and faith and sincerity and still mean an almost Christian? What makes a person a real Christian? Well, it's possible to have virtue and faith and religion and sincerity and still be an almost Christian. You find that in Scripture. And I can sort of tell you about that from my life. And I want you to forgive me for telling personal stories, but I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, I had gone to church all my life. But for far too much of that life, I was an almost Christian. I wasn't in danger of being, you know, sort of a stereotypical, you know, sinner that you might imagine. I was in danger of being the almost Christian who sat in church every Sunday and was viciously judgmental about people all the time. I avoided evil. I made good use of my time. I tried to do good. I went to church. I got baptized. I took communion. I tried to be serious about what I was doing. I was as virtuous as I could be. I tried to do godly religious things. I was sincere. I wanted to do what God wanted me to do. I fought the good fight and I kept the faith and all that. 
but I really didn't have the love of God poured into my heart by the Holy Spirit. I didn't love God. To be honest, I was really afraid of God. And to be also honest, I didn't really love my neighbor. I loved some of them. They were easy to love, the ones that I loved. And I really didn't trust in Christ and Christ alone for my salvation. I trusted in me. I trusted in the stuff that I did. And I used all of the right biblical, theological phrases, but I trusted in me. I was an almost Christian. You may be thinking, some of you, Trav, you're kind of a nice guy. Your wife's a better preacher than you are, but you're a nice guy. How did all this happen? Some of you may be thinking beyond that. Some of you may be thinking, Trav, I don't want to be an almost Christian. I want to be a real Christian. Tell me about that. Well, that's next week. That's why you have to come back next week. Before we close this out, I want to ask you a third question. Why would someone stay an almost Christian? First thing I think is false ideas about the Christian faith. Too many people have false ideas about the Christian faith. Many people think it's just about morality. Uh, you can tell these folks because all they talk about is morality. I agree with morality. The Bible does talk about a very specific set of moral codes, but it's all they talk about. Um, other people talk about tradition. Um, they talk about the Christian tradition and this and that. That's all they talk about. And other people talk about social duty. They don't talk about Jesus. They talk about supporting the church. Very few people see the Christian faith of what it is. It is supposed to be a total change in who you are, a total union with God. And the Bible says this. Whoever is united with the Lord is with Him in spirit. And then... If it is just about morality and tradition and social duty, this is what happens. Is folks like me are expected to do at least two things. They are expected to entertain on a weekly basis. Or second, they want me to teach about the six steps to a healthy marriage or how not to be a jerk or how to live a good life or whatever those things. I don't know about your life. I don't understand the depths of your soul. I have to spend like days, hours, weeks with each of you to understand that. But I know the one who does understand your soul. And so do you. And the Christian faith is all about him. It's not just about morality. Morality is involved. It's not just about tradition. Tradition is involved. It's not just about social duty. Social duty is involved. It's about a person. The Christian faith is about Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our faith helps us in the eye of the storm. It doesn't avoid the storm. The storm comes up. But it helps us in the storm. Folks, it's about, as Jesus himself said, it is about being born again. And this scares the ever-loving daylights out of those people. Because they want the easy thing. They want just morality. Or they want just tradition. Or they want just duty. These are all wonderful things. And I could wax eloquent about how each of them accentuates, develops, and deepens the faith. But without the love of the Father, the blood of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, all of these things, morality, tradition, and duty, they are dry as old boot leather. <coughs> now, on other people, so many people are basically are afraid of, or are, are, are almost Christians. It's basically because they're afraid. Uh, people are afraid of what other people will think. And I go back to the story of William Wilberforce. You're probably tired of hearing about this guy. But William Wilberforce converted to Christianity and took his seat in the British Parliament. And he was bound and determined to end slavery. He could have been the Prime Minister of Great Britain. He had a good friend, um, William, uh, not William, what's his name? I forgot the guy's name. But they, could have, they were buddies, and they could have basically swapped back and forth being Prime Minister of Great Britain. <coughs> Instead, William Wilberforce chose to be laughed at. His political allies let him down again and again and again, and his enemies attacked without any prejudice. But William Wilberforce endured. And as his health declined, slavery was finally made illegal in the United Kingdom because of his leadership. And a few years after he died, slavery was outlawed throughout the entire British empire. William Wilberforce did not do this 
primarily out of social concern. He didn't do this because it would win him allies. It actually got him laughed at for most of his life. He did this primarily because he loved Jesus. And he took very seriously those words. Friendship with the world means enmity with God. And anybody who chooses to be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Today we love the praise of the world and we love the praise of culture more than we love the praise of God. Billy Graham says this, our society strives to avoid the possibility of offending anyone except God. Now Paul was on trial in this scripture. He was on trial for being a Christian. Now he was a pretty good lawyer in terms of Roman jurisprudence, but he wasn't really trying to defend himself. He was an altogether Christian, as John Wesley might say. What he was doing was using the trial of one of the most powerful people in Judea as a moment to testify, witness to, and share the gospel to these guys. Portius Festus, the Roman governor of Judea at the time, who replaced Pontius Pilate and King Herod Agrippa, Agrippa II. He was the Roman puppet king in Judea at the time. And Festus shouts at him. I always think of Uncle Fester when I hear that name. Like he's bald or something. And his name is, the first name is Porcius, which is related to the word for pig, but that's another story. Okay, anyway. And he shouts at him, you're crazy, Paul. All your learning has made you bonkers. And he was probably laughing at him too. Festus was right at some level. Paul was smart. And Paul probably thought that Festus was a lost cause anyway. But he was gambling on Agrippa. If you read the text very closely, Paul is gambling on Agrippa here. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. Paul replied, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. Can you hear? I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice. Better am I. Because it is not done in the anything in secret. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Huh, 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 huh? I know you do. But there's the subtle shift there. It's not so subtle, but subtle actually. Agrippa is the one he's really talking to. Agrippa is the one he's really going after. Because Agrippa, at the time, Christianity was just emerging. Uh, Agrippa was not an almost Christian. He was sort of an almost Jewish person. Um, and that's why he was focusing on him. He might uh, have been open, open, to the witness that Paul was sharing. And I bet that Paul looked Agrippa in the eyes when he said, I know you do. And a lot of Christian preaching still is like this, what Paul has done here. Um, you might be here, and you might be an almost Christian. And God can change that now. I walk up and down the hall of my soul, and I've done it for the last 27 years. And that's how long I've been doing everything I can to keep, take the Christian faith seriously. And I still see parts of me, and it shocks me. Sometimes I round the corner and I'm like, oh, it's like, you know, a Frankenstein monster around the corner. Parts of my soul around the corner of my soul is still that way. There's still parts of my life that I am struggling to find surrender to Christ. But Paul still preaches to me and he still preaches to you and the word will not return empty. Then Paul says to Agrippa, or excuse me, then Agrippa says to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Almost not persuade me to be a Christian? I think Paul was getting to Agrippa. And I bet that Agrippa said that with a tone that so many of the world's powerful have used right as they come to the edge of Christ, right to the edge to the hem of the garment of Christ. But inside, this powerful man was this broken man. He was full of false ideas, and he was full of fear. And that may be like you. <coughs> Paul replied with these words, a short time or long, I pray to God, that not only you, but all who are listening to me today, that includes you, if you're struggling, if you're on the edge here, may become what I am, except for these chains. And what he meant by that was, is a Christian all together. So if you need to come to Christ, 
the time is now. So come, let the world laugh, let your ignorance be overwhelmed with knowledge. Be persuaded. Be persuaded.